I've had multiple iPads since the release of the original in 2010. Each of them ended up on a desk or in a drawer after just a few weeks waiting for an airplane travel day. The third gen 12.9 inch iPad could have suffered the same fate if not for the added mouse support and the iPad Magic Keyboard. So after six months with the iPad Magic Keyboard, is it worth it? Let's see. Hey, I'm Jerry and the iPad Magic Keyboard changed every perception I had about the iPad over the last 10 years. For me, it transformed the iPad from the de facto content consumption device while traveling to at times the only computer I would use for months on end. And it all started with the laptop-like form factor with a twist. The hinge on the iPad Magic Keyboard is unlike any hinge I've seen before. Actually, it's two hinges. The first hinge raises the iPad off the keyboard, and then the second hinge kind of folds it back to bring the bottom of the iPad just above the keyboard and allowing for viewing angle adjustments while keeping the center of gravity closer to the front of the iPad Magic Keyboard. The iPad just attaches with magnets and floats above like this. This is so unique and actually functional because unlike the Apple Smart Folio keyboard, you can actually change the angle however you want and make adjustments to get the perfect viewing angle, just like on a laptop. Let me just say, there are a ton of first and third party keyboard cases out there for all iPads. And most of them just have two or one viewing angle. And I don't wanna knock them too much because they work, they hold the iPad up but having a range of motion is huge for actual usability, whether the iPad is sitting on a desk like this or sitting on your lap and adjusting for glare or comfort. Now, let's talk about keyboards. It feels good. With the 12.9 version, the main keys are full size and it's super easy to switch back and forth between other Apple devices like a MacBook Air or my iMac wireless keyboard without needing to rethink how I type. As explained before, there is a lack of function row keys, which is a little disappointing because it would be nice to be able to adjust the brightness or the volume from the keyboard, but I'm guessing it has something to do with the overhang of the iPad. When I type with the top rows of letters, I frequently hit the iPad with my fingers. For some strange reason, as I type, I stretch out the other fingers that I'm not pushing the keys with and they rub against the bottom of the keyboard. It's kind of annoying, but I think it's my fault more than it is Apple's. It's a bit distracting, but at least it doesn't throw my train of thought off anymore like it used to. I do wish there was more distance between the iPad and the keyboard to avoid this. The keys are backlit on the iPad Magic Keyboard, which makes using this in the evening on the couch or in bed much better. Again, there's no function row for key brightness, but they can be adjusted by going to settings and general and keyboard and then hardware keyboard and then keyboard brightness. That is a bit annoying. But because it uses the ambient light sensor of the iPad and it automatically adjusts the brightness of the keys based on that, I find that I rarely need to actually adjust the brightness manually. One last thing about the keyboard is that it's pretty comfortable to type on when sitting on a desk. And I think it's because of the very low profile of the lip. Unlike a laptop which has a higher bottom case, the iPad Magic Keyboard is incredibly thin which doesn't require me to raise my wrists very much when typing, and that helps me type for longer periods without needing breaks. Below the keyboard is a trackpad that uses the mouse support added in iOS 13.4. I know, you already know this, but the cursor on iPad is not like the cursor on a computer. It was built to act more like a finger, which has a much larger touch point, and it snaps to certain objects as it gets close to them. The trackpad is kind of a strange trackpad for 2020 Apple, more of a hybrid between modern MacBook trackpads and trackpads of yore. It is a fully glass trackpad with multi-touch that can be used to swipe between apps or home screens, scroll in any direction, take you home, and just adjust settings. You can still click the trackpad anywhere, unlike an old diving board style trackpad, but like the old diving board style trackpads, it is mechanical. It's not like force touch on the MacBooks and the Magic trackpad too. It's pretty cool how it works, but I do find that it requires more pressure to click compared to Apple's other trackpads. And when using it for a long time, I start to feel a little fatigued in the hands. Maybe it's some kind of placebo effect, but I'm not a fan of the trackpad click on this guy. You can enable tap to click on the iPad settings, which I have, and I prefer to use that as much as possible. Oh, and the trackpad is a bit on the small side. Usable, but nowhere near the size of Apple's other trackpads and a hair smaller than the Microsoft Surface keyboard cover. On the rear left side, Apple added a USB-C port for pass-through charging. 
This port can only be used to charge the iPad and cannot be used with accessories, and that's totally fine with me. Having that extra USB-C port is really helpful when actually using the iPad and charging at the same time. The power passes through the pogo pins on the case to the smart connector on the iPad. The back left location is actually much better than the middle right side of the iPad. It keeps the cord out of the way and keeps the iPad USB-C port available for accessories as needed, like for an SD card reader or an SSD or an Ethernet adapter or HDMI adapter or a USB-C hub for all of them. It's a small thing, but the extra USB-C is super helpful. So that's really all of the features of the iPad Magic Keyboard. But let's talk about a couple other things. First, the rubbery material it's made of. It looks really nice brand new. It's a matte finish with a tackiness that keeps the iPad where you put it. Over time, it starts to pick up grease and oil that gets harder to remove. I've tried Goo Gone, rubbing alcohol, Dawn dish soap. They seem to help for a while, but eventually stains from your skin or tables or wherever you set it just start to sink in. This along with worrying about scratching or tearing the material somehow gave me anxiety about actually just using it. I found that the best thing for me was to cover it in a skin and a comment on the channel pointed me to the Soapy Guard skins. The skin was very easy to apply and I was able to cover the front, back, and insides of the keyboard in about 20 minutes. And it makes the iPad Magic Keyboard feel like a completely different device. Not only does it have a much different look, but it actually feels more durable and nothing's going to stain this thing like it will with the rubber. I do want to point out that I did damage my iPad Magic Keyboard when I was making my six week review video. is like that. Oh. I made a weird mistake of just trying to adjust the screen from the bottom of the iPad and I wasn't really holding the iPad when it popped off and put a small gouge next to the uh, delete key. I know that scared some people off and they decided not to buy the iPad Magic Keyboard because of that, but when you actually use it, you can clearly feel that you should be adjusting the iPad, the angle of the iPad from the top of the iPad. The iPad really does stay put exactly where you put it. It stays on the case with the magnets and has never fallen off unexpectedly. As far as durability in that respect, I don't see it as an issue. The sharp edge of the iPad fell onto a sharp rubber covered edge of the case. If the case were aluminum, it would have dented that. So there's no fault in design in this respect. It was my fault for not having a grip on the iPad when I took it off and when I was lifting it. Then there's the weight. The 12.9 inch iPad Magic Keyboard is nearly the weight of the iPad Pro itself and together they're about the same weight as a 13 inch MacBook Pro. That might come as a bit of a shock to someone who buys this case and assumes that the iPad will still be very slim and very lightweight. I personally do not find this to be an issue since it has essentially acted as my laptop replacement for many months. But if I had to carry this and a laptop more frequently together, I would probably be looking at how to ditch one of them. And third, there's battery life. As reported other places, there seems to be a little bit extra additional battery drain when idle and attached to the iPad Magic Keyboard. Most people speculate that this has to do with the backlight on the keyboard, and I've seen before where my iPad was asleep, but the light on the keyboard was actually still on. The amount of drain is usually not noticeable for me, but there have been times where I found the iPad to be much lower battery life than I expected. I think if you're leaving the iPad idle for a long period of time, just folding it kind of you know, helps reduce that issue. And fourth, the price. There is no getting around it. The iPad Magic Keyboard seems expensive. At $300 for the 11 inch version and $350 for the 12.9 inch version, that's 35 to 38% the cost of an iPad Pro and 50% the cost of the new iPad Air 4. How can a keyboard be worth that? Well, sure. You can get a $15 Bluetooth keyboard and a $20 mouse and add a case, but that's a pretty clunky solution. You can look at a third party like Logitech, which offers a case with a built-in trackpad for cheaper, but it's bulkier and takes up a larger footprint on the desk. And no other case offers an additional charging port. For me, the iPad Magic Keyboard offers all of the things that I need in an iPad case to use it as a laptop replacement. I get adjustable viewing angles, a great backlit keyboard, 
built-in trackpad, and an extra charging port, all in a single portable laptop-like solution. The trackpad allows me to edit text easier, scroll web pages, launch apps, and get home without needing to reach up and touch the screen. The ability to attach and detach the iPad from this keyboard in a second allows this device to instantly switch between being a tablet and being something I can actually get stuff done with. Hey, future Jerry here. I was just finishing up the edit for this video and I did realize that I actually have another second ding here on the keyboard. This one, I have no excuse for. I have no idea where it came from, but I wanted to make sure that I did let you know before this video went out. This doesn't change my overall feelings about the iPad Magic Keyboard, and I definitely see how others would decide that after this, especially the second one showing up on here, that this probably is not the case for them because of the cost, because of the type of material, etc. However, if it were me, and I am me, if this thing died today or I lost it somehow, you know, traveling to, you know, another place, I would not hesitate getting another one of these right away. The utility of this, the design, the features that this offers, and the compact all together package makes me still want to go out and buy another one if I needed to, despite some of the issues with the casing and apparently some other things. Back to the show. So the bottom line is, yes, the iPad Magic Keyboard is worth it. After just a few hours of using it, you can see how one accessory can transform your iPad from the original content consumption device to a clear content creation device. But hey, what if you actually want to use your device outside or in a very bright location? Well, you can install a matte screen protector like I did, which gives you an anti-glare display and a better texture for writing with the Apple Pencil. And if you're looking to see more about that, you can check out this video right over here. Hit the thumbs up button if you liked it, hit subscribe if you want, and I'll see you next time.